Welcome to River Run Christian Church Online. We are so glad that you joined us this morning. If this is your first time here with River Run, experiencing what goes on with River Run and our worship services, we are glad that you are with us. What we really desire though, is that you come out and you join us. So if you happen to be in the Melbourne, Florida area, we would love for you to join us here in the dome and experience some of the energy, the excitement that takes place when we gather as a church family to worship God. If you're unable to join us live, we are grateful that you decided to spend your morning with us. And I do pray that this worship service is a blessing to you and your walk with Christ. Well, good morning, church. Let's get ready to worship God today. People come together, strange as neighbors, our blood is one. Children of every nation, of every nation of kingdom come. So don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up high, don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. So take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where our help comes from. Sing this out. Whoa. Let 
is in his blood. Sing Jesus. Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, his kingdom come. Oh, my words fall short I've got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often do but every song must end And you never do So I throw up my hands And praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not much I've nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing Hallelujah Hallelujah I've got one response I've got just one move with my arms stretched wide I will worship you oh. So I throw up my hands And praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not much I'm nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing Hallelujah 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 So come on, my soul, but don't you get shy on me, lift up your soul. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. So come on, my soul, but don't you get shy on me, lift up your soul. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Don't you get shy on me, lift up your song Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord Praise the So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. So all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for.
for a king Except for a heart singing hallelujah Hallelujah Amen. We're going to take a second here. Go ahead and have a seat. We're going to take communion together as a family. If you came in today and you didn't grab the communion elements on your way and just raise your hand, just stay where you are, raise your hand and someone will bring some to you. Keep your hand up until they bring them to you. And while that's happening, let's just sit in this moment. Remember what Jesus did for us that makes this so special. And Jesus, you loved us so much that you came and met us wherever we were, that you loved us as you found us. Whether we were broken, the worst point of our life, whether we were in the midst of some of our greatest successes, wherever we find, wherever you found us, God, you loved us. But you loved us too much to leave us there, that you pull us, you draw us closer to you. So for today, I pray that for every person in this room, that they would be drawn to you. Their hearts would be drawn closer to you. And we would bask in your presence this morning knowing that you gave so much. Where we were sinful, you were perfect. Where we were broken, you made us whole. Where we had a debt we could never pay, you paid it for us. We praise you for that this morning. In your name, amen. Just take this time, take a, take a few moments here and take communion. We're gonna sit in this time of worship, sing a couple more songs. Just commune with your father this morning. I've been strong and I've been broken within a moment I've been faithful and I've been reckless at every bend I've held everything together and watched the shatter I've stood tall and I have crumbled in the same breath I have wrestled and I have trembled towards surrender She's my heart and drift and drifts it home again Plundered blessing till I've been desperate to find redemption And every time I turn around, Lord, you're still there Before I was nigh, as grace to the spirit, for all my mistakes, in that part just wrecks me. And I know I don't deserve this kind of love that song. It's a grace I could never earn To be somebody you still want 
somehow you love me as you find I think your glory needs my praises But if this viral breath is yours, Lord, take it all Cause you are faithful and you are gracious And I'm just grateful To think you don't need a single thing But still you want my heart Before I was lost, I was yours. Before I was not, you wear the skies for all my mistakes and that part just sing this with me today what could I say what could I say what could I do but offer this heart oh God completely
praise you this morning. We lift up our, our arms to you in praise. We lift up our eyes to you. Lift up our voices to you. We give you all of us and we praise you that we have a place to come and sing out your praises to honor your name in the honor of the sacrifices you've made for us. We love you so much. We praise you and thank you for this place, this family. In your name, amen. You guys can have a seat. Good morning, River Run. My name is Audra and welcome to church today. We're so happy that you chose to join us. If you're a first time guest today, we would love to meet you and get a chance to say hi. Please feel free to come up to any of our ministers and introduce yourselves. Also, on your way out of the dome just to the left of the entrance, there's a free gift just for you. Feel free to grab one on the way out. Now, here's what's happening at River Run. How would you like to join your River Run family as we serve on a mission trip in Jamaica? Well, you can. We will be serving in Jamaica with Rays International from June 3rd through June 10th, 2023. We will be doing construction projects to help the local community as well as building relationships with those on the ground in Jamaica. To learn more about joining this year's missions team, please join us for an informational meeting that will be held after second service in the Dome on December 4th. We are looking forward to having you join us. Here at River Run, nothing we do happens without the generous gifts of every single one of you that has chosen to partner with us. If you would like to partner with us, there are three ways to give. One, you can drop your offering in the boxes on your way in or out of the dome each week. You can text River Run, one word, no spaces to the number 73256 or you can go online to riverrunchristian.com slash give and click on partner with us we're so thankful for each and every one of you that is helping move god's mission forward here at river run now let's grab our bibles sit back and get ready for this week's message Do you know what the secret of life is? No, what? This. Your finger? One thing. Just one thing. That's great, but what's the one thing? That's what you gotta figure out. Good morning. Um, Wanted to just start off real quick um, and share with you something that happened as a result of last week's sermon, last week's message. Last week's message was about um, building unity in the body by serving each other. I had a, um, had a gentleman, John, uh, he came in to the office, said that he would like to start a men's ministry that is based on meeting the needs of the people in the church. So what he's doing is he's just asking if as, as the guys of the church would like to be a part of that, um, he would kind of get information, compile needs as they come about, and then kind of send out little strike teams to go out and take care of needs of people within the church. So if you are interested in being a part of that team and you do not know John, reach out to me. I'll make sure to introduce you to who John is so you can get to know him and get signed up with that. And if you have needs that the church can help come alongside, um, just give an office call or whatever. We'll get those to John and his team and they'll get around to help meet those needs whenever they can. So May, uh, May 24th of this year, a new world record got set. Um, I don't know if you paid attention to it or not, but it was set by Nathan Paulin, um, and this is what his world record was. It took him just over two hours to walk 2.2K, which in the U.S., that is about 1.36 miles. So two hours to walk 1.36 miles out to Mont Saint Michel in France, which is a monastery. It's kind of out on an island. Whenever the water comes in, it's on an island. When the water is gone, it's not on an island. And you may be sitting there thinking, why in the world is that a world record? Because I could walk 1.36 miles in about a half an hour. Well, 
Apparently, Nathan did this while suspended 100 meters or 328 feet in the air on a tightrope. 1.36 miles on a tightrope takes an amazing amount of balance, okay? Although most of us aren't going to be walking on a tightrope, we're not high wire artists, uh, my guess is that most of us have a balancing act that is probably just as daunting as what Nathan did on a daily basis. And that's going to be our one thing this morning. Uh, before I do that, though, let me kind of give you an example of what, what I'm talking about, about what this balancing act is. This happened, it, true story, happened on Friday. Um, I drop Aaliyah off at school. I, I take her to school every morning. I drive her, drop her off, and all that stuff, so that's not a big deal. Well, Friday, I was driving. I was dropping her off, got in the car loop, kind of dropped her off at the car loop thing. And I noticed about three cars back is this dad, I'm assuming. Um, I don't know the family. Um, dad dropping off his kid in a black Ferrari. As a kid in high school, I absolutely loved Ferraris. That was my dream car. So it definitely caught my attention seeing this Ferrari drop some kid off at high school. And immediately I started thinking and probably getting a little judgy. My first thought was, that is the absolute most prideful thing I have ever seen. Now, granted, it's 8.30 in the morning, so I hadn't seen that much that day. But I'm sitting there thinking, how much more prideful can you get? I mean, here's this kid pulling up to high school in a really nice looking black Ferrari hopping out in front of all of his friends. What could scream, look at me more? Then I thought, well, that's probably not good. I don't know the family. I mean, maybe that's totally, I'm totally misreading that. So I kind of calmed down a little bit and I thought, well, maybe, maybe this isn't a prideful thing. Maybe it's a totally neutral thing, right? I mean, maybe, maybe dad got up and, and he was driving Tommy, I don't know the kid's name, um, driving Tommy to school and he's like, hey, Tommy, listen, man, I got some bad news. You know, the Honda's in the shop today. Um, we got to take the Ferrari, okay? I mean, is that, is that going to work for you? I mean, so it could have been totally neutral. It could have not been a pride thing at all, okay? So I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. Or it could have been a total humble thing. This really could have been done out of humility. I mean, Thanksgiving's coming up, right? So you've got family coming in. Maybe Tommy has a rich uncle named Bill, and Uncle Bill, you know, has a ton of money and decided he was going to drive his Ferrari down for Thanksgiving dinner, and, and he's talking to Tommy on Thursday, and, and he's like, hey, man, how, how are things going? Tommy's like, I had an absolutely terrible day. My girlfriend dumped me. You know, football team's making fun of me, gave me a wedgie. You know, I, I, I flunked my algebra test. I, I don't even want to go to school today. And Uncle Bill's like, how about if I give you a ride in a Ferrari? Okay, I mean, it could have been a humble move, right? My guess is it was totally done in pride, okay? I, I can't think of any other reason. And I do want to say, first of all, like I said, I don't know the family. If you happen to be here today, <laughs> we're going to be talking about tithing, <laughs> which is the biblical concept of giving, okay? Um, no, but seriously, if, um, you know, I, I don't know that family at all, but I do want to tell you this. If, if that was you, you totally missed the boat on how to really be prideful, okay? I'm going to totally step out of the preacher's stage for a second. This is how you pull it off in real life, okay? You let Tommy drive the Ferrari to school, and you let Tommy get out and call you Jeeves, and just say, hey, Jeeves, make sure whenever you pick me up today that it's washed and waxed, please. Okay, that's how you pull off a prideful move with a Ferrari dropping a kid off at school. I don't know why in the world someone would do that. I'll tell you what, my guess is, although we don't have Ferraris, or at least I don't, all of us have this balancing act between pride and humility on a daily basis. Let me read the definition of pride and humility for you just real quick. Pride is this feeling of deep pleasure or satisfaction derived from one's own achievements, qualities, or possessions. It's all about you. You want to look good. Okay, that's pride. Humility, on the other hand, is a modest or a low view of one's own importance in relation to others. It's not that you tear yourself down. You know what you have, but when it comes to others' view of yourself, you kind of make sure that you're not up here, you're 
down here. Now, I like those definitions because we're going to talk about pride and humility, particularly humility today. And we're going to look at how we can become more humble. And I need to understand that humility is not necessarily based on the value of what you have, because I've known a lot of people that have had very little from a material standpoint, but yet have continued to be very prideful people. And I know a lot of people that have a whole lot of stuff from a material standpoint, but yet are very humble people. So it's not necessarily the value of your stuff, it's the perception that you're giving other people about who you are. And so we're going to look at how, how that works for us as believers, for us as Christians who, who follow God. And we're going to be in the book of Ephesians. We're going to continue reading through that book for, this, for today. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, flip over to Ephesians chapter 4. And the first thing I want to do is I want to make sure that we, we place the correct value on who we are. Who are we in Christ? So if you have your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 is where I'm going to start. I'm going to read through um, to chapter 5, verse 2. And this is what it says. It says this, it says, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their hearts. Having lost all sense of shame, they have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with a craving for more. And let me just stop there for just a second. You know, when Paul's talking about Gentiles, to him a Gentile was a non-Jew to us to be the same as a non-believer. That's kind of what he's referring to. And what he's saying is, you know, understand that you as a believer, although you used to be a non-believer, although you used to be alienated from a relationship with God, you no longer are that. You know, there's a sense of this false humility among Christians that we don't want to be holier than thou. We don't want to, you know, we don't want to be seen as better than anyone else. You know, put that to bed for a second, okay? Because as a as a child of God, as someone who has come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, you are better than the fallen world around you. Understand the value of the sacrifice of Christ in your life. He has lifted you out of the sin that is around you. And yes, that makes you holy. Yes, that makes you righteous. Yes, that separates you. You are valuable to God as his child. And that doesn't mean that those who are outside of Christ are not valuable because we're told that while we were yet still sinners, when we were in the midst of our sin, Christ came and died for us. So yes, God loves the non-Christian. He loves the non-believer. He loves them so much. He sent his son to get him out of that mess. But for us that have accepted Christ, we've been delivered from that, and that is valuable. So understand your value. Continuing on, Paul says, this is not the way that we came to know Christ. Surely you've heard of him and were taught in him and keeping with the truth that is in Jesus to put off your former way of life, your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on a new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. We used to be like the non-believer. We once were non-believers. We once were sinners alienated from God. But when we come into that relationship with Christ, it separates us, it makes us new. He gives us his righteousness, his holiness. And we're not, there's supposed to be a gulf there. There's supposed to be a difference when people look at you that you are different than the world that you came from because you've taken off that old and put on something new. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. We're all members of one another. Be angry, yet don't sin. Don't let the sun set upon your anger. and Do not give the devil a foothold. He who's been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing good with his own hands, and he must have or that he may have something to share with the one in need. Let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building up the one in need and bringing grace to those who listen. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, outcry, slander, along with every form of malice. 
Be kind and tenderhearted to one another, forgiving each other as Christ God forgave you. Understand that that little list that Paul just kind of put out there, that's not an extensive list, okay? That's not a, hey, now that you're a Christian, here's your list of do's and don'ts, okay? That's not what he's trying to say. What he's saying, though, is listen, whenever you come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, your life is going to be different, You're not going to steal anymore. Instead of stealing, what you're going to do is you're going to work with your hands so you have something good to give. You're not going to talk down to people. You're not going to be malicious with your words. You're not going to be obscene with your words. Instead, you're going to build people up. You're going to lift them up. You're going to try to to speak some life into, into who they are. The way you talk is going to change. The way that you think is going to change. The way that you act is going to change. There's going to be a noticeable difference in your life because you've come into a relationship with Christ. And then he wraps it up in in Ephesians 5 and verses 1 and 2. He says, be imitators of God therefore as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant sacrificial offering to God. Understand your value. Separated from the world that we came from, a world of darkness and sin, understand your value now as a child of God. He looks at you and calls you his son. He looks at you and calls you his daughter because of the sacrifice of Christ. And so yes, we have value. Yes, we have a new identity. Yes, we have a character. And yes, that can be very tempting to become very prideful about. It can become very tempting for us to adopt that holier-than-thou attitude. It can become very tempting of us to have this religious pride that we are better than somebody else. So we have to maintain that balance between pride and humility. And I think the way we do that is by looking at what our core verse is today. It's actually found in Philippians 2. And Paul says this, he says, "...have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus." who though he was in the form of God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the form of human likeness. So if you want to be humble, have the same attitude of Jesus. You know, it it was, I don't know how long ago, maybe 25, 30 years ago, um, the big thing was the what would Jesus do movement, right? WWJD, okay? Show your hand if you bought a bracelet, a coffee mug, a hat, a t-shirt, a bumper sticker, you know, anything like that. Uh, How many of y'all had a what would Jesus do thing, okay? Um, So it was kind of cool. It was great for youth ministry, okay? And it was great for whoever thought up those four initials, Um, you know, because what would Jesus do was kind of the thing. And the whole idea behind it is whenever you're in a situation, stop, think, act the way that Jesus would act, right? The problem is whenever you ask the question, what would Jesus do? It's totally subjective because I do not read in the gospels. Jesus was walking down to Capernaum and some guy in an ox cart cut him off. And this is how Jesus responded. Okay, I don't read that. So I'm just suggesting, I'm guessing that whenever something like that happened, this is how Jesus responded. I I don't know how he responded, okay? I wish they would have just changed one letter. I wish instead of what would Jesus do, it simply said, what did Jesus do? Because there's a whole bunch of that in the gospel. And if we boil down, what did Jesus do? What was the heart of Jesus' ministry? I think we find it in in Luke chapter 19. Here's the story. If you grew up in in church, you grew up in Sunday school, you probably even know the song, okay? This is what happened. Jesus was on his way down to Jericho. So Jesus is walking to Jericho. There's a little big short guy named Zacchaeus. He can't see over the crowds. And so Zacchaeus decides he's going to climb up in the sycamore tree, okay? So Zacchaeus scurries up this little sycamore tree. Jesus is walking by. Zacchaeus is looking at Jesus. Jesus looks up, sees Zacchaeus. He says, hey, Zacchaeus, why don't you come on down out of that tree because we're going to have lunch at your house today. So Zacchaeus scurries back down the tree, comes on, goes through the crowd, standing next to Jesus, right? And, and as Jesus is walking, Zacchaeus is looking up because he's short. And so he like looks up at him. He says, Jesus, listen. Listen, man, if, if I've cheated anybody, I'm going to pay him back four times. 
And not only that, I'm giving half of what I own to the poor. And the crowds, as Jesus is walking with Zacchaeus, kind of start talking behind their, behind their hands to each other. They're like, you realize, realize Jesus is hanging out with a tax collector? You know, tax collectors are like the worst of the worst. They were the untouchables. They're like, you realize Jesus is hanging out with this tax collector? And then Jesus looks at Zacchaeus and says, hey, Zacchaeus, listen. We're going to go to your house. We're going to have lunch. I want you to know that salvation has come to this house because he's a, he's a child of Abraham. And the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. When I think about humility of Jesus, I think that is the greatest summary of what he came to do. You have God stepping out of heaven to become a Son of Man. And in that process, he didn't lose his identity. He still was fully God, okay? But he called himself a son of man. And he did that because he wasn't making demands of his divinity, okay? When he's hanging out with the crowds and everybody's talking behind their hands and talking behind his back, he didn't turn around and say, listen, I am God. Why don't you just pipe down? I'm going to go have lunch with this guy. He didn't do that. Instead, he just said, hey, listen, the son of man, came to seek and save the lost. In my humility, I came stepping out of heaven into this darkened world, into the sin-filled world to save people like him. So if we want to learn humility, I think our hearts need to be the same. We understand our value as being children of God because of Christ's sacrifice for us, And in humility, we need to look to those around us and say, you know what, they're in a dark place and I need to go save them too. That's that's being humble. Let me warn you of this. When we adopt that type of humility, when we adopt the type of humility that says, I see people that are lost and I want to go help them, you become very vulnerable. Your vulnerability is heightened because you're going into a very dark place. If you haven't noticed, this world is not encouraging to those that want to follow Christ. This world is is separate from God because of sin. And that's where the unsaved are. And that's where we need to go. We need to go into the dark places. We need to be willing to touch what some consider to be the untouchable because of our relationship with Christ. But it makes us vulnerable. And and Paul goes on. This is what he says. And he's writing to believers in Ephesians 5 here. He says, but among you, as is proper among the saints, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality. I'm going to stop there because he's got three things lined up, but let me just stop at the sexual immorality thing. Sexual immorality, a hint of sexual immorality is not just the physical act of sex. If you want to talk about a hint of sexual immorality, go look at your playlist. What kind of music are you listening to? Go look at your browser history. What have you been looking at online? Go look at your continue watching list on your streaming device. What have you been watching Okay, it's not just the act of of physical sex that he's talking about. A hint of sexual immorality means that in your thoughts, in your actions, in what you hear and what you see is all pure before God in sexuality. Okay, and if we need to define what purity and sexual uh, of sexuality is in God's eyes, come and talk to me. I'll be more than happy to break that down for you. Okay, but I guarantee you the world's not promoting it. Paul says, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or greed. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, crude joking, which are out of character, but rather thanksgiving. Thursday's Thanksgiving, that's my Thanksgiving message, okay? There shouldn't be any obscenity, foolish talk, crude joking. You know what? 
if we go out and have lunch and I let you talk about yourself, which you probably would because I would, by the end of lunch, I could tell you what type of person you are. Because the words that come out of our mouth are a true reflection of what's in our heart. And if your words are obscene, if you're joking as coarse, if you are rude in what you say, that's all coming from your heart. And Paul's saying as a believer, you've been separated from that. Get rid of it. Continuing on, he says, for of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, greedy person, that's an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience. Therefore, don't be partakers with them. Okay, I'm reading the rules as they're re- revealed in the book. And if you walk out of here and you go, you know what, man, he really didn't mean that. Yeah, I did. Because that's what it says. Okay, don't let anyone just sugarcoat it for you. This is serious. For you were once in darkness, but now you're in light. Walk as children of the light. For the, light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Test and prove what is pleasing to the Lord. Whenever you are in a situation where you're going in and you're going to talk to a non-believer and you encounter things and ways that a non-believer lives, ways that maybe you used to live that can be enticing to you, that can be tempting to you, test those things. Look at what's being offered to you and say, does this please God? Would God sit there and slap me on the back and go, man, good job. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Or did he say, no, you stay as far away from that as you can because that does not build up your character and it does not reflect my character. Test those things. If they fail the test, don't participate in them. I'm not saying that you hate the people that are. I'm saying you don't partake in them. The way Jude says it, Jesus' brother, he writes in Jude verses 22 and 23, he says, and indeed have mercy on those who doubt, save others by snatching them from the fire, and still others show mercy tempered with fear, hating even the clothing stained by their flesh. Don't participate in what they're doing, but love them with everything that God gives you to love them, because they don't need to be in that situation either. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And if we want the same type of humility, we will do the same. But don't fall for what they're offering. Paul continues, he says, Have no fellowship with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it's shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for everything that's illuminated becomes light, itself. When we go into the dark corners that people are stuck in because of their sin, we don't go in there to party with them. We go in there to flip the light switch on and say, listen, what you're doing is not right. And what you're doing, you're doing because you're lost. You're doing it because you're looking to fill this void that's inside of you. And I'm telling you right now that the stuff over here isn't going to fill you up. What's going to fill you up is a relationship with Christ, and we need to make sure that we flip on the light so we can expose the darkness and we can point them back to Christ. Because that's what he came to do. As we do that, we become vulnerable, so we need to make sure that we stay vigilant. That we constantly stay aware, that we constantly stay alert. The way that Paul says it, he says, pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to reckless indiscretion. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and sing and make music in your hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of 
of the Lord Jesus Christ and submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Peter in in 2 Peter, he writes, or actually records or, or rewrites a proverb that's in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs says this. Proverbs says that just as a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool returns to his folly. And Peter also adds on that, you know, you can, you can clean up a pig, but that pig's going to go right back to the pig pen. And I think that's the warning that he's trying to give us as believers that as we reach into the dark places to bring the light of Christ to those that may need it, make sure that you don't go back into what it is that you were delivered from. Don't mess around with the sexual immorality. Don't mess around with the impurity. Don't mess around with the greed. Don't mess around with the pride of life. Don't mess around with the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh. Don't mess around with sin. Go in and save those that are stuck in it, but don't get stuck in it yourself. Be wise in how you approach it. Be wise in how you reach out to those that are suffering. You know, an excellent youth ministry thing that illustrates this. If you had a chair here, you know, I, I hear all the time, you know, or at least I used to, I don't so much anymore, but I used to hear all the time that, you know, you would have these kids and they're like, yeah, my boyfriend, my girlfriend, whoever, you know, they're, uh, they're, they're not a Christian, but I'm dating them so they'll become one. Okay, whatever. Um, you know, but that, that was their thought or, you know, I'm hanging out with all these people. I know they're not Christians and I know I shouldn't be doing what they're doing, but you know, I'm hoping that, that I'll, I'll make them a Christian as a result. You know, the, you used to have this example in youth ministry where you would have a chair or a stool or something like that. And you would have one person stand on it and you, you would have them try to lift somebody up. Right. And sometimes they could lift up one person. But whenever you have like 10 people surrounding that chair, instead of lifting those 10 up, usually those 10 pull you down. And it's the exact same thing with us as adults. Okay? Be wise in the way that you approach unbelievers and the sin that they're stuck in. My suggestion to you, and really it's Jesus' suggestion because he did it, when he sent out the disciples, he sent them out two by two. Sent them out in pairs because their strength in numbers. If you're going to, uh, going to talk to a non-believer, if you have somebody that you're praying for, somebody that your heart is reaching out to, my first suggestion to you before you even go talk to them is you go talk to a brother or sister in Christ and say, hey, listen, will you pray with me? Because I'm going to go talk to this person. Will you hold me accountable as I go talk to this person? Find strength in reaching out to those that are lost. That's the model that Jesus set up. You know, guys, at the end of the day, in this balance between pride and humility, for us as believers, it can be very easy for us to get spiritually prideful. It can be really easy for us to adopt this holier-than-thou attitude and think we've got it all together and, you know, we're we're the most special because, you know, God loves me the most and, you know, whatever you're going to do with that, right? But the reality is we need to be humble. We need to have the same attitude of Christ who even though he was God, didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself, he became a slave, he became human so that the Son of Man could seek and save the lost. We need to make sure that as God's children, we understand our value in his sight, but that we're willing to go out and see our loved ones, see our schoolmates, see our workmates, see the people sitting around your Thanksgiving table this Thursday that don't have a relationship with Christ and say, you know what, I love you so much, I'm going to go into that dark place, but I'm going to expose it to the light so you can see who Jesus is. That's humility. That's putting somebody first. Let's pray. Father, it is really easy for us to get messed up in in our relationship with you. 
first of all, in just who we are because, you know, we don't want to be prideful. And because we don't want to be prideful, sometimes we sit there and we, we act like we're not, not any better than anyone else around us. But the reality is, you sent your son to die for me. And my sins are forgiven and, and that broken relationship's been restored because of what he did. And yeah, that does better. That makes me better than some of the people that are living outside of that relationship. And I don't say that in a prideful way. I say that in a thankful way. I am so thankful that you're willing to do that for us. And Father, as we understand who we are and what we've been set free from, and we see our friends, we see our family, we see our loved ones that are still stuck in that sinfulness and still stuck in that disobedient life separated from you, our hearts should cry out as Jesus did that we want to go and rescue them too. And Father, if we decide to do that, I pray through your Holy Spirit that you keep us righteous, you keep us holy, you keep us separate from the ways of the world because it's tough to go into that dark place and not get wrapped back up in it. But that's what you've asked us to do. And so, Father, I pray that you give us, first of all, a compassionate heart. You give us a humble heart to put others' needs above our own. And then you give us the protection and the courage to go out and make a difference. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. So this was a message primarily for believers. I mean, that's what Paul had written. And you may be sitting there, you know, we may have some unbelievers here with us today, and you may be sitting there going, well, man, that was kind of not very nice to tell me that I'm not in a relationship with God. You're not. If you were outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ, the reality is, the way the Bible explains it is, you are stuck in your sin, and that your sin separates you in relationship with God. That's why he sent Jesus Christ, so your sins can be forgiven, and you can have that relationship reconciled. That's why he came. I'm not going to sugarcoat it and and slap you on the back on the way out and say, hey, man, I understand you don't have a relationship with Christ, but that's good. That's okay. That's not okay. You need to have that relationship with Jesus Christ. That's something you need to settle starting today. That's why Jesus came. So if you need to talk about that, you need to pray about that, I I just, I hope that you come forward. We're going to have, Dave's going to be up here. He's going to pray with you guys. He'll talk with you. I'll catch up with you afterwards. And we can talk about what that means to start that relationship as we stand and we sing. Salvation, Jesus for us. 
this time. Lucky us. Hey, go ahead and have a seat for a second. Um, anybody that knows me knows I am freaking out right now, okay? I don't like being in a box. Um, we, had a, uh, we had a contest, for those of you who are like, what in the world is that guy doing? Uh, we had a contest with another church, Tomoka Christian Church, to see who could raise the most uh, Operation Christmas Child boxes for our Operation Christmas Child Drive. Um, and we said that the winner would be found in a box on Sunday. Um, we didn't win, okay? But I am wearing a box because even though we may not have collected as many boxes as Tomoka, our church did win. Uh, this year we had over 200 more boxes collected than what we had last year, which is amazing. <laughs> Combined between us and Tomoka, we had 800, let's think, 890 boxes. If you, uh, if you recall on the opening video, David reminded us that for every box that's collected, or every, all the boxes that are collected, um, one child out of every two boxes will statistically accept Christ. That means with our combined that we have the opportunity for 445 children to accept Christ because of the generosity of our churches. Um, and that's a win, okay? It's a win for the kingdom. Also, this is not box related and I'm not gonna wear a turkey suit. Uh, I wanted to also bring to your attention a win that our church has for Thanksgiving through our food ministry. We are gonna be giving out tomorrow 100 complete Thanksgiving meals to people in our community. Turkey, eight sides, everything because of the generosity of our church family, um, which is awesome. Food ministry is doing that. We appreciate what they're doing. The youth ministry on, on Wednesday came out and they packed the, the bags and all that stuff, which was great. So thank you guys for coming out and doing that. But I can't thank you enough for the generosity of this church family and whether it's through boxes to kids, whether it's through bags of food to our community, we are sharing the love of Christ with those around us, and we're making a difference. 
So thank you for that. And for me, that's worth standing up here in a little box. Okay? Let me go ahead and close with a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you for the way that you've put it on this church family's heart to reach out to those that are hurting. And whether that's through a shoebox, whether that's through a turkey dinner, I pray that that the people that receive it understand that that's being given because of our love for Christ and our love for them. And I pray that in turn they turn around and they give you thanks, but even more than that, if they don't have a relationship with you, that they give their life to your son because of that. Father, thank you for the way that you love us and opportunities you give us to serve. To serve in humility because that's what your son did. We love you, Father. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. You guys have a great week. Have a great Thanksgiving. Hey, thank you for joining us this morning. We are grateful that you were able to experience River Run online. If you are new to the River Run family, we want to encourage you to fill out the digital connection card so we can get to know you a little bit better. Also, if there were any questions that you had, maybe from the service or just the church in general, please reach out to us, send us an email. We would love to connect with you in that way. And if you're willing, we would really appreciate you partnering with us financially. You can help support the ministries here at River Run by either texting to give or by giving online. Whatever it is, we want you to become a part of the River Run Christian Church family. And we hope that this church family becomes your church home.